Hi, friend. Welcome to This Plus That, a show about connecting the seemingly unconnectable and why it matters. I am Brandy, of course, your host. And this week, I have, again, a bit of a weird episode. I've never done a two-part episode, but the last conversation that I released with Emily McElroy was four hours long in its actual original recording. And the first part that I released last time in the last episode was two hours. I cut it down to two hours of sort of the initial chunk of that four. And I just realized that there was so much additional good content that I decided I wasn't just going to release it um, like little bits in small YouTube clips or something. I wanted to actually give you a full extra hour of the conversation that I had with Emily. And interestingly, what happened in this part of the conversation that you're going to hear today is that we technically were off mic, right? Like all of the best content always happens when you think that you're no longer actually recording. And so I have run it by Emily just to make sure that she's okay with me releasing this, but we recorded it under the presumption that we weren't actually going to air this publicly. But there's a lot of good stuff in here, especially personal to me and sort of vulnerable to talk about in a public way. You'll hear me sort of discuss that with Emily. And th yeah, there's just so many good things in terms of um, we talk about religion and faith and how that intersects with our identities and how we are or are not willing and excited about or scared about talking about that in the world and why we talk about uh, being an artist and, I don't know, just continued thoughts on the intersections of painting and prayer. But because we were actually, quote unquote, like off air, this isn't, I'm still titl titling this, uh, you know, painting plus prayer part two. But it's not necessarily focused on the same thing that we were like intentionally talking about in the episode. It, it is a lot more meandering. It's not focused solely on those things. But we do cover a lot, especially at the beginning, on religion and faith and those things and our background and where we've come to today with those things. And uh, the thing is also that because we were technically off air, there's a bunch here where, again, like we sort of meander around and I had to cut it out because there were certain things that neither of us actually did want public. Uh, there were things that both of us sort of requested that we kept private between each other in the conversation. And so there are certain parts where I was just incapable of actually giving you as the listener or watcher, if you're watching uh, on YouTube, the sort of full breadth of the explanation of where we hop to in conversation. So there might be pieces of this where you're listening and there's you're like, wait, how did they get there? Or what are they referring to specifically? Like, there's a part where uh, we talk about my process right now of going through or leading up to dental cavitation surgery, which I've talked to uh, um, talked about on the podcast before and I've written about in my newsletter before. So if you're curious about that, you can go read more about it. But I cut a huge part of my sort of description of that to Emily uh, out of the show. Uh, Emily also talked to me about some therapy work and someone she's worked with in the past. And uh, that explanation sort of gets cut out. So you'll hear her mention therapy, but uh, talk as though there's something that she's referring to that you're not actually going to hear. So there's things like that. There's also, um, a, you know, several times I often, and I think in the previous episode with Emily, refer to Lauren several times. And if you don't know yet, Lauren is one of my closest friends. She's uh, the one that you will be familiar with if you've listened to or watched the episode with Charles Eisenstein. Her name is Lauren Buckley, but she is a great friend of mine. So I refer to her also without sort of explanation in this uh, audio or video that you're going to listen to or watch. So what I'm saying is that there was so much good stuff here that I didn't want to keep you from hearing it solely because it didn't flow in some sort of logical or fully explained way. So I hope that you enjoy it. Again, Emily is uh, a, a painter and she's also, I think, a beautiful writer. And so we talk about that. We talk about uh, the piece that I wrote for her. And again, if you haven't listened to the previous part one of this episode, then go back and listen to that where I read sort of the response that I wrote in relation to Emily's work and how we met in the first place. Uh, but yeah, there's just so much rich richness in this conversation that I wanted you to hear it. So please enjoy it. and. Yeah, fall even more in love with the work and mind of Emily McElroy. I 
I think actually aliveness is that like, I think um, maybe it's about like, okay, I'm going to do a bad job. I mean, I'm going to uh, ramble at you a bit, which is like saying I'm voicing out loud things that I've only said in private and also quite a little bit terrified to fling myself off a cliff of um, publicly. But like the other day I was I having a honored. moment. <laughs> Thank you. I was having a moment where I was on this, like, you know, uh, my morning incredible mystical walks uh, here in Boulder. And um, I was listening to On Being <laughs> and uh, Krista opening up one of her recent episodes quotes um, an ancient sort of um, poet and philosopher, a Greek philosopher or something that I hadn't heard of before. And she says, myth is not something that has never happened before. It's something that happens over and over and over again. And I was just like so struck by the voicing of that. You know, it's like, oh, something you felt for a really long time that something, someone finally sort of puts into words. And I was just sort of contemplating that. And I had this moment because I, I grew up in Christianity. I grew up in the South. And I say that really loosely because my family wasn't really um, practicing Christianity. But like I was living in the South and sort of culturally it was everywhere. We were swimming in it. and. I we grew later. up just about two and a half, two hours apart. I grew up in Norman. Oh my God, that's right. I remember you saying that in your interview with Drew. And I was like, I have to talk to her about how much I hate yeah, OU. Yeah, we used to go play <laughs> soccer tournaments in Dallas all the time on the weekend. Yeah. yeah we were just backyard. Well, hook em horns, which is just a very <laughs> site-specific reference. But anyway, um, yeah, that's incredible. Um, but yeah, so... Probably similar, though, it sounds like your family at least were, I mean, taught Sunday school and such, right? Your dad taught Sunday school, it sounds like. Yeah, he was really teaching world religions at our Episcopal right. Church, with you, which no <laughs> one like seems to know about. But years later, when he revealed this, they were like, we would have had you fired if we knew that that was going on. Right. When he died, you know, people were writing in like, you know, I never learned more about Buddhism than I, you know, even in all my world religions as a world religion <laughs> major. I never learned more about Buddhism than I did in your father's Episcopal Sunday school class. <laughs> Wild. Yeah. I mean, it sounds too like, I mean, he was giving you books on meditation when you were very young. So yeah. obviously like you grew up in a very spiritual lineage, but my parents weren't really like that. And um, I didn't start going to church until sort of late in high school when it felt like something came along that needed to save me. Um, and um, yeah, I, there's a, obviously like a much longer story around that, but um, I started going to sort of church and whatever, and I ended up going to like a, um, un, a faith-based undergrad school. And um, it wasn't until like I came out at 27 and I like, you know, sort of contended with what Christianity and uh, queerness meant at the time. So there's like been sort of a lot of struggle around that in terms of like, what what does faith look like for me? And I was just sort of thinking on this walk after hearing that from Krista about I think a lot of the times, a lot of time in the world, we tend to think like if we make one decision or choose one option, that it makes everything else cut off. Like it, it makes, how do I want to say this? It's like, um, it's like if we're overly feminine, then the masculine is killed or vice versa. Or if... Um, if I choose Christianity, it means that everything else is a lie or um, or Buddhism or, you know, fill in the gap of whatever that might be. And I was sort of just thinking about like, actually, in my sort of later experience of life, it feels like you making a choice makes everything else more alive. Like, holding the contradiction is that sort of aliveness. I'm not doing a very good job of describing this, but... Um, Maybe the easiest way is just to tell a personal story, which is like, I think very quickly that like, you know, sort of my trajectory was like sort of growing up in Christianity and then contending with it and sort of like doing away with it. Like I did not identify as Christian. I still don't identify as Christian um, and sort of finding what still felt like a way that I practice daily, some sort of like mm, something that was like engaging with divinity or something. But like I was, I didn't describe it as Christianity. Um and now in the last couple of years, I think especially in actually doing this project, like some wild things have happened, <laughs> like synchronicities, things that can't be explained, tumbling sort of un unplanned deeper into my purpose than I felt like I've ever experienced. Um, 
and yeah, jumping off of all an awful lot of cliffs for the first time. And um, not that I'd not spent a lot of my life in the deep waters, you know, but like, I think especially artistically and like doing my work, I guess, like very specifically felt like I'd sort of in that way, jumped off of a lot of cliffs a lot in the last couple of years. And in doing all of that, it's almost like um, I'm I'm so t- <laughs> it's like uh, terrified of saying it because I don't like to say it without about 10 hours of context. But um, it feels almost like Christianity is more alive to me now than it was before. Like all the things that I I sort of learned in my early tradition of going to church, or at least the way that I learned it, that didn't resonate with me anymore, now is actually more enlivened. And in in feeling like maybe I might sort of re-engage in practices or language, like you said, I really love to think about, I think now, faith or religion of any sort as like, this is just like the language I know. It doesn't mean that like when I say that language, I don't believe that other languages are equally valid. Um, But I think a lot of times people do. And that's sort of the point I'm making, I guess, is that like, I'm sort of having this experience of going like, I think so many people think that when you choose a language, all the other languages are dead or Mm -hmm. that like they're less true. And for me, I feel like in my experience of the sort of engaging with aliveness that like, now sort of thinking I might be going back to engaging in some sort of like, let's call it a religious practice. And I have no idea what that will look like. And it might still look like very esoteric and not actually like, I don't know, going to church or something. But like, it feels like me re-engaging in that and choosing like one path to sort of study maybe actually enlivens everything else even more. Um, instead of being like, well, I'm choosing Christianity and that means that everything else is untrue. It actually feels like it makes everything else a thousand percent as true. If that Maybe makes any like sense an, at yeah, all. Yeah. It's like an entry point, right? At least you, you have a door to go through now. Right. Yeah. You've got to pick somewhere. Life. You've got to pick somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> like you've got to pick like, up the brush or pick up the instrument or pick up the pen. Right. You've got to like, pick one of them. Jesus had to choose a time and a space to engage in, in a biblical story. You know, it's like in Jerusalem, in, you know, Rome, like to be physically embodied means to have to choose a thing. And then I think, I think participation is a, um, a useful word there too, right? Like as soon as you make the choice, you're participating. Right. And once you're participating, then you're enlivened. Right. Yeah, it's it's like we same similar stuff. It's like if we think that if we cut ourselves off from it, that that will be that will keep us alive. But actually, it's sort of a deadening of life. But when you choose to participate, and even if that means you have to choose a direction, that when it seems maybe like you're cutting yourself off from everything else, you're actually fully engaged, and it makes yeah. everything fully alive. And I think you always have to choose a direction, right? I mean, you, you, right, there can be multiplicities too. I know you're the 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 conversation of the generalist versus specialist, right? But but in a in a moment, you have, have to make a choice. You have to right. move in a direction. Like if you're going to do the dance, you have to like pick the song and pick the partner or the time. Like there has to be a yeah. time and a space for that to happen for there to yeah. be a happening. Yeah, um, that to me is paralyzed like... on the sidelines, not choosing anything because you think they're all the wrong choice. Then you just end up with flatness, I guess, or right spectatorship yeah totally i was gonna say or it's like either a paralyzation and deadening or it's like that um in some ways i think artistically it was like having to choose one thing felt like it was going to tear me apart because there were Mm -hmm. like so many options i was like confused as to how to make a choice but then you did make a choice what's that you did make a choice at some point, right? Like, yeah. And well, I mean, the interesting thing about doing this podcast or like the, the work I do under the name this plus that is that it not only was like a container for me to hold all of these like seeming contradictions in myself, my, myself and others and the world in general, but also it was like one way that like I had like a narrowing of focus. So in that way, it was like making a choice. I was like, I am going to make a podcast and I am going to write. And I'm sure that will look a lot of different ways as I go on. And I am going to, I'm going to name the thing. Um, So like there were a lot of like narrowing and cutting off other options. But 
the thing that made it feel comfortable enough for me to approach was that this plus that is a never ending source of generative creativity. Like I can, there are a never ending amount of combinations that I can make in an X plus Y for myself and talking to others, you know? Um, so it felt like a way to narrow, but also to, um, yeah, it, it's like a, a lens that didn't cut me off from everything else. Right. It still allows you to see in multiplicities. Right. Yeah. That's why I went into art. <laughs> I, go, I could do psychology or science or, you know, but if I do art, I'm allowed to make art about anything. I'm allowed to research anything. Yeah. 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 That's what sort of what David Epstein says at the end of our, the very end of our episode, he's talking to me sort of after the credits and says like, um, you know, yeah, at some point I, I, I didn't want to just be a scientist because I realized as a writer, I could just research everything like, uh, which is what you're saying basically about art is that I can be into anything I want. I have but, to cut myself off from nothing really right. by making this one choice. I open myself to. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Because yeah. You, we do need a whetstone, right? We do need an entry point. We do need, um, something in which to engage with and shape us and we don't do that by uh you know sitting in the middle of the room and not touching any of the things in the space not taking out any of the toys you know i don't know it doesn't make sense yeah so, yeah completely well thank you for sharing that yeah <laughs> Yes, you're welcome. I'm still, I'm working it out for myself, but I, I think that seems to, in my experience, it feels like it's sort of ringing true, both in like, like you're saying with art, it's like in making a choice, everything else became more possible, I guess. Is it scary just because of associations that you have with Christianity or fears of what you think other people might associate with? Yeah, I think mostly, uh, like I've said in other episodes that like, I'm, I'm still contending with what it is to sort of like live my own faith story out loud. You know, like I have, the, and I guess it's like in being a creator, you have the benefit of your entire life experience and context and not every, no one else ever will, you know? And so I think in choosing to actually finally do your work publicly, you have to sort of get used to the fact that like, uh, it's not worth it. And you just never could explain yourself fully to everyone else. And so like, if I go, oh, I'm like, you know, I'm whatever it's like it feels even weird in my body to say like practicing christianity again um like if i if i sort of went down that path that saying it publicly feels pretty terrifying because that means a lot of thing things in society right now that i don't actually mean um the challenges that people inevitably are going to hear what they want to hear even if you took a thousand hours to describe where you're coming from to them and, you know, right before I launched the podcast, I was talking with Lauren again and just sort of going like, you know, this is the moment at which I decide that um, it's okay to not be understood and it's okay, like, to not be fully understood or that, like, you're never going to please everyone and you're going to make actually quite a lot of people unhappy. <laughs> like, you might actually make them very angry. And I think, especially around saying something that I think would be considered pretty Unitarian Universalist and saying, when I believe one thing, I actually believe, believe everything, like they're all equally true. Um, you know, I've, I've watched in my life people like Rob Bell, who were, you know, deep in sort of evangelical Christianity, um, get fully kicked out of that <laughs> um, and have their whole lives collapse around it, you know? And so I don't really feel it that deeply. Like I'm clearly saying it out loud. It doesn't terrify me all that much, but it's still what is somewhat of an interesting thing, just especially I think to talk about um, faith things in a way that isn't just like devoid of being attached to a particular religion, I guess, you know, I think we've in a lot of conversation, I feel like, like we, I think we feel comfortable and I'm using a like royal we, I guess, like we feel comfortable 
um, talking about spirituality or woo or tarot or like these things that are sort of seen as like alternative or like um, maybe metaphysical studies. But the thing I find interesting in that, and now I'm, I'm about to go on a thing, I'm going to like write about this soon maybe, is that like I realized, so there was a point in time where I was doing a lot of work around shared space. Like I was, um, I was a community animator, <laughs> this is my job title. And my job was to help um, make connections between all of the organizations in the building so that they could do symbiotic work together. And um, in all of that work, it's like I was seeing all these like spaces pop up in the world, like we work and, you know, name any shared space where people sort of like desk together but aren't actually in the same organization. Um, I saw this thing culturally happening where it was like, we're so fucking terrified of commitment and intimacy. Like, it's like we've built situations in which we can just sort of show up and not actually have to, like, build real committed relationships. So people are, like, hot desking and they're, like, they're, like, traveling to San Francisco and they're going to sit in an office here and then they're going to go to Seattle and they sit in an office there. And, you know, like, it was, um, it was like nomad culture, I guess, had sort of, like, seen, it had, like, sort of fleshed itself out to an unhealthy end almost. And, again, unhealthy is, like, a, it's a judgment word <laughs> but um but i just saw it as like a manifestation of all these things that were like happening with us actually spiritually that like in relationship like we're i think i was contending with too like polyamory like being in queer culture i'd been you know all, among all these people who were practicing polyamory in their relationships and um this is not a judgment of polyamory either but like that sometimes the way that we engage with things like that is actually an avoidance of intimacy rather than expansion of intimacy. And so it's not to say that like nomad culture or travel or, poly or polyamory or any of those things are inherently bad or wrong or whatever. It's just that like I think taken to an extreme or in a certain direction can actually result in a lack of intimacy and connection. And, and so I started seeing even in my own life how like um, like not being connected to land as a, as an example, like being committed to like this house, this piece of land, these people that are my neighbors, this city that, um, I felt like I was missing something. And I think in a similar way, I think with religion, we've gotten to a place where we feel okay talking about the sort of like, um, detached version of that that's like i'm spiritual i don't really want to be labeled i um i just i like everything and so in that sense i think even christianity or any religion that sort of has a contention with going like universalist thinking is uh, a mess i'm like okay i actually understand that in one way because i think universalist thinking or you know polyamory or nomad culture or whatever, anything that sort of like sees itself out to a result that is actually detachment rather than choosing a thing and um, building intimacy as a way of actually expanding your life rather than deadening it. Um, that I think in a similar way, I've sort of seen my own faith sort of do that trajectory that was like, in it and choosing one thing and then having to rebel because I saw that one thing was actually not, it didn't contain as much as I, my experience of the world felt like it, like the universe actually told me it should contain, you know, I'm like, the universe is like way more than this. And so like sort of cutting all that off. And so I think getting to a place where you're like, I can't hold choosing just one thing. And then now as a, an older adult, sort of getting back to a place where I'm like, whoa, I've like done enough of the like, opposite extreme of detachment sort of from any grounding religion or tradition and now I feel like choosing a thing is actually more enlivening like I've done the work to sort of understand that like I don't choosing one thing doesn't make mean that like the rest isn't true like I said you know and um so I th I think actually that's sort of the work of just like um yeah the personal self-development work of being okay with intimacy and um, realizing where non-attachment actually can be harmful to you in your life and that making a choice and dedicating yourself to a thing, like a relationship, a dating relationship, a marriage, a home, a city, or the country, like wherever it is that like building an intimacy with those things. And I think a lot of times, even as white folks talking about spiritual things that 
I think especially like we don't, a lot of us, I think don't have actually grounding spiritual traditions that like we don't. Groundedness is the word I was been thinking as you've yeah. been talking about this. It's like, you're looking for a groundedness. Yeah. Which to put these things into practice like before it felt limiting is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But now you've gone out and you kind of stretch your mind and you've detached enough to see things more clearly. And now you want some ground again. Right. Yeah. And it's, and, but it's yeah, not it's necessarily, um, you know, there's all these other things that are really in, which is, you know, it's, again, I, I hesitate a little bit to say this, but I think kind of what I was hearing you say is maybe uh, there's some philosophies or approaches to life out there, which just non-attachment is somehow elevated or prioritized above mm -hmm. um, actually committing yourself, right? It's, you're, I think yeah. you said it's um, really avoidance. You know, it's not just exploration or expansion, it's avoidance. And I think it's a really interesting distinction to make, right? And then say, how can you be unattached, you know, have non-attachment, but also be moving from a grounded place? And I yeah. think there is a lot of value in having a tradition or a structure or some rituals. Um, I do think we need that. <laughs> I think we need certain attachments. We need roles. Um, and how we choose to kind of define those roles and how big the community is and what really, yeah, then you get into all of those really complex questions. But I think it says something about our culture in general that one would feel afraid to publicly voice wanting to have some some kind of grounding in spirituality that is, that's troubling. Well, I, I don't so much feel like it's a grounding in any spirituality. I think it's particularly around Christianity, but it's, it's a, it's a natural sort of rightful, again, like poor language for it, but like sort of response to oppression and, um, yeah, uh, traumatic, um, experiences of that particular religion. Yeah. It's interesting because I, I think I've had, you know, similar experiences. I remember going to Young Life camp or, you know, Bible camps in middle school across the country, you know, this youth group that was very um, popular to be in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and kind of getting sent off to, you know, California or Minnesota and ending up as like, you know, 11 or 12 year old in this camp with all of these people who were telling me basically at, you know, middle of the week that I was going to hell because I was expressing viewpoints. I was like, whoa, hold on a second. Like it's just I, a Tuesday. What is happening right now? <laughs> um, because my, you know, my experience with Christianity up to that point in my household was uh, much more inclusive than what I was encountering with the kind of more evangelical fundamentalist um, churches that I was kind of just exploring because that was uh, what the cool kids were doing yeah um, I, that's where my soccer team you know i played competitive soccer and that's where my teammates were going and i just i couldn't accept some of the things that i was being told and i said that and then they spent the rest of the week trying to save me and i remember calling home and telling my parents what was happening and it was really traumatic i wanted to come home i said i don't want to finish yeah. the week out here yeah um and I also really pulled myself away from that after those experiences. And also now too, it's interesting. It has kind of felt like things started to come full circle when I, you know, I was mentioning the centering prayer earlier. And I actually consciously refrained from saying I'm not religious because I have that the same kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's an impulse. Too, yeah. To, to try and, you know, have a disqualifier there. Wait, hold on. Um, but I, I kind of, I don't think I did that. I think I tried to refrain from that and yeah no I don't I don't think I remember kind of you like what that. you were saying where I'm kind of at a point where I feel like I if I have a practice that is spiritual and centering and beautiful to me then I don't need to <laughs> I'm tired of trying to excuse this and you know I'm in academia and in that yeah. environment a lot where I do sometimes feel like I've had to do that and, yeah um I feel like I am coming full circle to some of these old Christian texts and the lilies how they grow I mean that's from a bible verse yeah, there's the lilies of the field and how they grow. They do not toil or spin. And yet I tell you, Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. I mean, there's beautiful things in the Bible when interpreted um, 
in a, in a certain light. Mm. And I think to cut all that out is just, yeah, that seems sad to me. I, I guess I, I, I sympathize, empathize with your kind of desire to <clears throat> explore, or maybe return to Christianity with, from a different, maybe more grounded per, place in yourself, it sounds like. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a really good way. Yeah, there's a, um, one of my favorite, uh, no, my favorite movie on the planet is Arrival. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen I just watched that the other night. Oh, amazing. <laughs> of course. Um, there's a part at that where the main character is, um, is, you know, as a translator is saying like, yeah, um, one thing can be a weapon or a tool. Cool. And I think religion in all kinds of forms, not just Christianity has often been used as a weapon. Um, and we, we make weapons out of a lot of things, science, religion, you know, anything really. Um, but it can also be a tool. And I think now I feel like I've sort of gotten to a place where it has stopped feeling like a weapon. And mm -hmm. I, and, and also that I don't distribute it like a weapon to make sure that I'm not sort of passing that harm on to other people. Um, but now I feel like it actually could be a very useful tool. That makes a lot of sense to me. A lot, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I've felt something very similar in my own life. And I felt some of those hesitancies when I first kind of entered into this prayer and felt like I needed to define for myself, well, what does prayer mean? And how is that different from the, from the weapons that, um, you know, I saw around me, you know, being wielded in childhood or even, you know, now looking at the news. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of beauty and tools there also. To a beautiful metaphor. Is your health okay? Are you all right? Oh, um, Yes, ish. I gaslight myself all the time in terms of what I actually experience in the daily world. But um, yeah, I mean, like a lot of folks, I have a sort of complex set of autoimmune issues that I experience every day from brain fog to fatigue to bad sleep to thyroid issues to gut problems and um, nutrition stuff. And um, yeah, it feels like a lived experience of being sort of yeah, half alive, actually. It's like um, my vitality isn't where I know that it could be. Um, and I've been in like a 10-year process of untangling that web in some way that makes me feel more actually present and alive in the world. So I think it's quite fitting, actually, that I'm actually um, one of Lauren's friends, Angela, runs a podcast. And she said something I was listening to the other day where she said, heal the soul and the body will follow. Um, and I was like, that feels so fucking true to me right now that like every time I dig into physical ailments, I realize that it's actually a spiritual condition. And I'm not saying that like, you know, your depression is just a spiritual problem or something, you know, like I think life is more complex than that. But for me, I feel like every time I've dug sort of deeper into my physical conditions, they're actually like spiritual misalignments, either from like what I learned culturally or in my family or like my own just experience or whatever. And so it seems interesting to me saying that to you, that I'm like, I've been in this whole long process of unweaving that. And now I'm experiencing actually more presence and more aliveness and all of those things. And it's coming when I'm actually doing deep work around my healing. Yeah, it's just, it's a, this is a year that's like deeply focused on health and regaining some of that vitality. And part of that is also doing like the work that I feel like is my purpose in the world to do. Um, and they're all one and the same, basically. Um, it's spiritual, it's work, it's money, it's how I relate to the world. It's, um, uh, you know, yeah, infections that have been living in my mouth for a long time. So it's all like, yeah, it's the, you know, pulling a thread that's all one big, massive weave of things. And so, yeah, it's a long way of saying I'm okay. But I just, I, I just had this really deep sense that like with a level of chronic illness that I have now, that's like functional, which is a terrible word, um, but like it's functional today, but I just felt like there was no chance that if I didn't address it now that it wouldn't be more expensive and more catastrophic 10 years from now. 
I almost kind of feel at this point, like that whole heal the spirit and the body will follow. Like I just, I feel like I'm doing so much deep spiritual work right now on healing um, that feels like perhaps my thyroid and everything else is actually just related to a spiritual misalignment that I've had my whole life, like the control, the like every, how that manif manifests or whatever. Like, and maybe if I actually heal, just like keep working on healing some of the underlying conditions, like supplements aren't going to be the thing I need. You know, like it's just like maybe some of that stuff becomes moot if I like actually heal what caused me to be right. sick in the first place, you know? I feel like, I mean, I've done a lot of talk therapy in my life and different modalities of talk therapy, but I just sort of got to a point where I was like, this trauma is in my body and I know yeah. it so viscerally. Like I can feel, it's like I could talk about it forever, but it's like trapped in here. In here. And it's yeah. like, if I don't ever like actually address it in here, we're just gonna keep, keep going in circle. Going in circle. Like talk therapy is just like, it's just like touching a surface of something yeah. that's like, buried somewhere it's like you never even got out a shovel like it's in Holy. here <laughs> like and it's it's like it's me but it's not me you know it's like I can I sort of describe it as like I feel like I can feel a brandy that exists that's like outside of that thing but like I'm trapped sort of like the trauma is just sort of in there and unless I like somatically find a way to release it like it's just like what are we even doing here Holy. which is why I'm like like I'm not doing the amount of body work I'm doing because it's just like luxurious and relaxing. I'm doing it because I'm like, massage that get trauma out. out of my shoulder. <laughs> like it, that is trauma. And I know it, like, I just know it viscerally. Like, even if it's, you know, woo or whatever, <laughs> like, I'm just like, that has been an experience. That's trauma living in my body. I got to get that out. And it has I've proven had no, go ahead. It's proven. Oh, say, it's proven to be true, basically. Like the more I do body work, the more I'm like, wow, I feel physically released. Like, and then all of a sudden I'm like mentally clearer and I'm like more present in my life. Like, what do you know? One of the questions I felt compelled to ask you that didn't end up coming out was like, how do you feel like grief has literally like shaped your body? Like, it, like I feel like that sort of grief contorts you in a way that it's yeah it's like a crowding like your body like actually becomes physically shaped by I don't know that sort of experience I feel like I was like I don't that's a weird question no it's <laughs> not like, a weird question at all and um did you did you have a chance did you read the promises blog at all did you do it have I tell you about the promises did you write it yeah it was this experience like right at um right out it was in the middle of the prayer paintings and it was um in one of my like 60 hour stretches of not sleeping where things were just getting worse and worse and i didn't want to go to the er because it's like they're just going to give me drugs and i'm going to wake back up in the same problem right. like i'll go right. if i have to to not you know commit suicide but i want mm. i need to get to the bottom of what's going on so it's like all right i'm going to go out on the grass and i'm just going to close my eyes i'm just going to sit there for you know 30 minutes and see if if anything comes and if not then I'll go to the ER and so I went outside and I closed my eyes and like immediately I saw my spirit like out of my body and I was like whoa shit it's yes I did read it because that is partially why I ended the first half of the writing with the like and then like you you fall through the passage and then you come out and you're on the grass and you're like like you're reintegrating with your spirit or something yeah like well the spirit she like I was like and what are you doing out there and it said, well, I can't live in there anymore because right. it's too sad. And that's what I was like, oh, fuck, that's the problem. Because I like my brain, it cut it off where I wasn't feeling the sadness anymore. Um, and so then I was like, well, what do I have to do for you to come back? And there were seven things. Anyway, yeah, the whole story isn't that important other than the fact that there were these seven promises that I had to make before my spirit said that it could actually live inside me again. And I had no idea it was like kind of like oh I have to do those things well how the fuck am I going to do that hmm. uh, but because of this therapist and the way they worked it was basically like I was able to um somatically so the grief had contorted everything so there, there was no place for the spirit left anymore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and yet so and that was yeah that can kill you that is very dangerous and it almost did kill me it did shape my body it crowded it out completely mm-hmm. and at the same time by forcing me to go in and um do those things that my spirit was asking and to do the uncrowding i like kind of the byproduct of that was i released all of this trauma that had been in there way before ross had ever even died so it was like my body mm-hmm. got cleared of like my body is maybe more clear now than it's ever been, ironically. Mm. Um, because when I, yeah, when I finally did go in with the shovel, it's like, well, we're just going to go ahead and <laughs> we're going to get all of this out. We're going to dig. So we're going to dig and we're going to dig to the very bottom. We're going to scoop this all out and we're going to make nothing but space in there for your spirit to live. And so I feel like Mm -hmm. in this kind of ironic thing, it's like the grief, like almost killed my body. And then now it's like just starting to flow again in a way where it feels like, oh, wow. Like maybe I'm going to go into my forties and actually feel better. Yeah, that's sort of how I feel. I have the sense that like the older I'm getting, um, and probably not for all of it, but for maybe hopefully, fingers crossed, a good chunk of my life that I'll actually feel better in my 40s and beyond than I have for most of my life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In different ways, there's a lot of grief in here. Um, yeah. And anger and all kinds of things that need to be cleared. I mean, there's a part of me that would be curious that like, if you did this and if you moved out all this stuff you're talking about, like would the infections in your mouth clear themselves up? That's what yeah. I mean. Is that I'm like, would I you could... even have to have the surgery? Like that's right. like a question I would have too. Yeah. It's, it's where I came to, honestly. Like, I mean, I just sort of feel like if I healed these sorts of like spiritual misalignments or whatever, I don't know how to describe it another way. Um, that like maybe my thyroid would heal itself. Like maybe the infections would heal itself. Like, I mean, yeah, any sort of like wild spiritual things that I follow now also are like energetic healing and like things that like are actually possible if we access something like that. And I think really, if I think about it practically, like the only thing that's really happening there is like a spiritual realignment. Like, and I had this like wild experience too. When I first moved here, I was like laying in bed one morning, probably the first week that I moved in. And my bedroom also, like my bedroom's on the opposite end and it has huge windows that are an Eastern facing. So I get sunrise on that side and sort of Western sunset on my office side. And so I was waking up and it was just like this gorgeous light beaming in and like I I sort of die without a lot of light in my house. And um, I was just like, I had this moment of just like overwhelming gratitude. Like just, I was sobbing and I was just like, I'm so glad I'm here. Like. I also even like moving out of the house with molds. Like I just, I had this like feeling like probably two days after moving in where I was just like, I felt a release, like something in my body felt like it released. And I was like, I don't know if that's like not living in mold anymore. I don't know if it's like a spiritual sort of like some sort of cycle has just ended. And now I feel like sort of released into something new, which makes a lot of sense because living in one city for 20 years and I was living in that house for six and, you know, regardless, it was like something just felt like it fell off of me. Um, and I was like in a new something and I felt lighter physically and like, I don't, I don't know, that's the best I know how to describe it. But so like all of this stuff was already happening. And then I have this moment, like lying in bed where I'm like, just overwhelmingly grateful and like sobbing in bed. And I'm like, it's so cheesy. And I genuinely don't know how to say it any other way than just like this deep, it's almost like a near death experience when you hear people describe like what they feel like it's so simple, but I was like, it just, I felt it so deeply that it was like, everything is love. Like I'm just like fully accepted and I'm fully loved and everything is love. And I actually feel like maybe the things in my body that are sick, like just are blockages of a flow of love. (laughs) It's just like, I I think so many people have a hard time hearing because it's like we just don't live in a world that really believes that and feels like Western medicine is like, well, no, you just like you take a pill and then it's solved. And I'm like, well, but a pill doesn't actually treat the underlying thing that caused it, even not spiritually, just like literally if I live in a house with mold, it's only taking care of my symptom, which is a good response to mold, meaning my body should be telling me that something is wrong. Um, But yeah, I just had this 
mystical feeling that was like, maybe all of my ailments will just disappear if I just like actually find myself cleared enough that I'm in a consistent state of like gratitude and love and like realizing that I'm loved and accepted fully and like all of those things. Is this making any sense to I you? Really, I think that's exactly <laughs> what it is. And I think that's exactly what is most likely to happen. Right. And so like maybe sometimes you need guides. Like this person is a guide, you know, but like, and we don't do it alone ever. But um, yeah, it did feel a little like maybe I don't need a naturopath. Like when you need maybe. someone who knows how to show you how to, you know, where to go with the shovel and um, mm. Mm. And to like hold that space for you to do that safely, right? Because it's yeah, it's powerful stuff, and anything that's powerful is also potentially dangerous, right? So you do need yeah, you need help. Yeah, it's like um, you need someone like to know you take mushrooms. That, like, it's like you're gonna need a guide on that process because you're gonna need to be tethered somewhere. Somewhere, basically. yeah. Um, yeah, I would. I 100% would not be the least bit surprised if all of those things happened and a lot of your ailments and pain started to just resolve themselves. Yeah. I feel that. I'm like, I mean, it's just, oh yeah. It's like, we can be esoteric about it, but I genuinely feel like practically it just makes so much sense. Cause I'm like the reason that my gut probably has problems in the first place is because it's been in a chronic state of like stress and trauma and fear. And if I like disentangle all like, and I actually like relaxed and I'm fully present and I'm not hyper vigilant and I'm not like like my whole body isn't in a constant state of like I don't know chronic yeah I don't know a different word for hyper vigilance like it's just not constantly going like my gut will probably calm the just fuck calm down, down. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh maybe if you calm all those things down you can sleep <gasps> without yeah. taking like you know all these tranquilizers which aren't helping you sleep anyway <laughs> no that's what i mean i think the shovel um, analogy is a good one too because it's like it, i most practitioners and most of society i feel like will tell you to use roundup it's like oh those are weeds we're just mm. gonna like spray them and as long as we're we can't see back. them it means that the underlying problem doesn't exist and you're like that sounds expensive and exhausting and probably also toxic, toxic. so let's actually it's actually an incredible analogy because like the best way to make your food better or to like bring life to you and your food basically is by like enlivening the soil like bring soil back to the life and the land like and the food heals itself basically and then the food heals you you know so like if we reintroduce like aliveness and vitality to the soil we live in then naturally a lot of things and disease and pests and stuff are going to go away um, and even then like talking, like sort of extending that analogy out or metaphor out to like, um, community, like if we're in closer relationships, like if our community is more healthy, then like we're more resistant to pests and disease in the first place. And like all of those things I think are like super fitting. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like the more I talk about it, the more I'm like, that seems just like the right way, you know, I actually, one of the things I've really loved about like when, you know, some practitioner at some point said to me, or I read somewhere that was like, most people, it's sort of a similar deal. Most people tend to try to attack the invader instead of um, strengthening the host mm -hmm. when it comes to health. So like, you know, get rid of the virus, get rid of, um, you know, the thyroid issues, get rid of um, whatever is invading you. Um, is sort of the common stance on health, but it's actually much more sustainable and mm, powerful if you strengthen the host, meaning if I'm more alive and healthy and my community is more alive and healthy, we are naturally more resistant to virus, to invaders or whatever. And also it's a terrible stance in the world to think of things as invaders, like you know, that like, oh, this virus is attacking me or, oh, this symptom is bad or my body's bad. It, it hates me. So it's like fighting against me. And you're like, actually, your body is like doing exactly what it was built to do, which is to tell you when something seems off. Um, and that's often I, I find has to be painful enough that we actually pay attention to it <laughs> um, in time to do anything about it. Um, and that was sort of my deal as I was like, 
I feel like my project right now when I decided to like do the the health and the dental stuff was like I'm this is a practice of strengthening the host. I'm making myself more resilient, more alive, more like all of those things. And instead of being like, well, infection is bad and virus is bad and like all of those things. Um, yeah. And that's, um, I feel like in doing this work, I've started to see or be really truly believe that our deepest sickness everywhere is separation. Um, and so that's like, you were separated from yourself and that you were so grieved that like your spirit didn't have room. Um, we are so separate from, I, you know, one of the things I've talked about too is like not doing work that matters to you, like continuing to choose to do work that you kind of hate and that like is also an energetic drain is actually a kind of toxic load. And it's also, it requires being so separated from yourself. Like you have to choose like you, you dissociate, basically, you become separate from yourself in order to continue doing work that just you think keeps you alive, but is actually kind of like only a half life. Um, and so that or like the way that we're disconnected from land, like we're so separate from land that we're made sick or nature in general or communities like that we see each other like that immigrants like we basically if you think about seeing things as invaders like you can also extend that metaphor to immigration and be like oh they're those people are just invading our country you know like instead of going like oh we're like part of the same whole like if we can't integrate everybody then we're just gonna stay sick um and so i've started to just yeah sort of look at ways like for myself like how can i sort of self-reflect yeah so well yeah self-reflect like what are the ways in which I am separate from myself and only in doing that work can I then start to do communal healing, I guess, of my own that goes like, how, how do I serve in a way that helps other people stop being separated from themselves and from each other? And et cetera, first you go get yourself. First you go get yourself. Yeah. First you dig to your own roots. And yeah, that's, a, that's exquisite presence. Yeah. And so one of the other things I was going to say, I was like out on one of those walks the other morning, I was like listening to your artist talk with Drew. And I like, yeah, I, I passed this like, again, like, it's hard not to just sound t completely cheesy, but I passed this like, um, and again, that's me. That's me prefacing. So I gotta stop that. But I walked past this like duck in the in the lake and it had this like bright, like the sunrise was like hitting it. So it was just like this bright emerald, like green swath of its head that was just like uh sort of indescribable and stunning and like a little bit later on the walk I saw this other bird that was just like all orange on the side and I was just like I had this moment sort of listening to you where I was like part of yeah like part of why people avoid this is because exquisite presence can be so painful like I like to be fully present in the sad and in the catastrophe and in the beauty like it's it's extremely painful in some ways. And I like I had this moment too where I was realizing like what was happening for me physically actually when I was like listening to you on this walk and like being in nature or whatever it was like um I remembered this terrible breakup I went through 6 years ago. It was like or 7 years ago. It was probably my biggest breakup, not probably actually. Um and it felt like a tearing apart like a, in a really violent way um for me. And the only way I knew how to describe it to people was that it felt like I was being gutted, like I was having a knife sort of dragged up through my gut like you would gut a fish, which was like really interesting to me, too, to hear you describe the experience of yours as like knives. You know, like it's just it is a violent like tearing apart. Um, but, yeah, it just felt like someone had like gutted me and my insides were just sort of spilled out and weirdly in this moment of like you know beauty and gratitude and like seeing this duck and the emerald and seeing this bird and this like beautiful orange and being so stunned like I just had this moment where I was like my body actually enjoy like in gratitude and connection and feeling like super enlivened actually feels exactly the same way it did when I was in deep grief Ooh. like it felt actually like my insides wanted to explode like I was just like, 
this is like so much and just had sort of this moment of being like, yeah, I mean, to be this physic, to be this present in life is so painful. Like Rob Bell, that person I mentioned earlier too, I remember at some point in listening to him, he was like, beauty can be crushing, can't it? Like, it's like, wow. I mean, to be that really attuned to beauty and pain and all the things is like, it's a lot to take in. Painful. Painful. And one is beautiful and one is terror. <laughs> it's just what I wrote. <laughs> Which is what you wrote. Yeah. Yeah. And so visceral. It's it's grief is extremely visceral. And joy can be also. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's less less painful when we um can share it with others. Yeah. I was going to say, too, I was thinking um, we were talking about God or dualism or non-dualism or something earlier. Like one of the things that was like really comforting to me also was like realizing like God in the Christian tradition, like when you think about the whole, the Trinity is a triad. It's not a dualism. And right. it's like a way to think about it. Like spirit is a dance. It's not like a um, black or white, I guess. The interesting thing too, I read about like that, you know, the creation story from it was like reading something about like Christianity from a non-dual perspective. It was talking about like the garden of good and evil mm. and, you know, original sin, how sin actually the root of that word just means separation. Oh, that was you. Did you listen to my episode with Charles and Lauren on no, purpose yet. plus illness? I literally yeah. bring that up. Like at oh, some really? point. In the interview, I was like, yeah, the actual original meaning of that was just separation. Just separation. And what caused the separation? Eating from the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was mean you chose dualism, right? Like it was, <laughs> that was it. It wasn't that there was anything poisonous or like terrible mm. about the apples it was, or that you did something that was like morally wrong. It's just like there was a choice to choose, dual, like to see from dualism and when you chose the knowledge of good and evil you chose the dual that was the separation and that's what was meant by being oh, out of the garden me. that's amazing like yeah that's what took us out of eden you know it wasn't like sin is in something that's like a bad or good this is how you get into yeah. heaven or you stay it's out of like hell. no you just put on the wrong lens <laughs> or you put on not even the wrong you put on a lens that now separated you from god right yeah, which is, yeah, that was a deep sort of spiritual understanding to me that it was like, oh, this like sort of sense I've had recently that like, you know, all of our sickness is actually caused by separation. I'm like, I've literally just described the Garden of Eden story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, so surprise, surprise. And again, like it's like whether or not you sort of, um, and this isn't me prefacing, but like genuinely like whatever story you believe, like I love that line about myth that it's like, whether it's you believe in the truth of the Bible and the Garden of Eden as like a legitimate story or whatever, or a real story or however you want to label it, like it's true because it's real. It's true because it's happened over and over and over again, like the story of separation and being cast out and cut off from the things that give us life and make us most alive. And it's in a freaking garden, you know, like, <laughs> so of course it is. <laughs> That's where you do all the digging. <laughs> totally. Um, so, yeah. That's so funny. I've never heard anyone say that back to me. But yeah, it was in my um, yeah interview with Charles and Lauren. Yeah, I love that. That was like a, like a really radical moment for me where I was like, wow, okay. Christianity from a non-dual perspective, that exists? Cool. With Whoa. this reading, the Bible becomes like gold. <laughs> Yeah, that's what oh. I mean is that like I've had this wild experience that all these things I learned as a child now seem like more true and more real than I ever experienced them when I was younger. And it's like all like I keep remembering sort of lines like that, like the lilies in the field or like, why would you worry about like your date? Like the lilies are taken care of, like the flower in the field is like solid, you know, <laughs> like why would you worry anymore or. Yeah, I don't know. All these like, you know, even stuff around doubt, like I was talking about my conversation with Lauren, like passages from the Bible that have come back around doubt to me or I don't know, everything just feels more real from the Bible. And that was like really unexpected. <laughs> like I, did, I really did not see that one coming. Um, 
And yeah, I had this other moment that like sort of in this process, I think it was either right before, or right after I launched the podcast, I was like having, I had dinner with Lauren's brother, Kyle, who is also just like, oh, we like to joke like his, I think his purpose in the world is a self faith. Like he, he is, he's like an agnostic that somehow walks around selling faith wherever he goes. He's just a magical creature. I had dinner with him and I had like, I was driving back from um, Boulder at dinner with him to Denver. I was like parking outside of my house that I just sold. And I was just, I was listening. Uh, like one of my recent practices has been like a morning where I, I call it joy practice. <laughs> and I, because I think we cellularly can only experience as much joy as like we've experienced so far. And so like practicing joy feels like a thing I've been trying to embody. And um, while I do it, I listen to these songs and they're usually like old Christian songs that I learned from way back then, but they like, they're still ones that like deeply resonate with me today. And I'll listen to them and sort of like jump up and down as though like something I've wanted to happen has happened. And um, they get me into like sort of ex extreme states of gratitude. And I had sort of a similar experience where I was like, I had just parked the car after conversation with Kyle, which was as always just mystical and incredible. And so I'm like listening to these songs in the car at like full volume. And I just start like weeping. And I had this like, yeah, internal feeling also that was like, um, God spoke to me in Christianity when I was younger, because that's what made sense. It's just like, it's the language I knew. Um, and I felt so deeply like other people have different languages and isn't it incredible that God speaks to you in a language that makes sense to you? Like what a, what a grace that is that you don't have to translate it to something else. Um, and yeah, also that like that sort of choosing or like, um, I don't know. Yeah. Just that it was all more real. It was real again, more real. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that real again yeah it's it was real again but like more powerfully than it ever was like the way i was taught it when i was younger it was like everything i'd been taught in the bible became alive for the first time you know like before it felt like a dead religion in a lot of ways like you know it served a purpose for me until it really really didn't <laughs> and then um and now it feels like oh yeah this is just the way i it's the language i know so it's like just the practice I have. And I've been personally like looking more into like Celtic Christianity mm. and um, also listening a lot to like, I don't know if you've ever heard of John Philip Newell, but whew, that dude, he's like a Celtic sort of spiritual. I have to write that down. I don't know if he'd ever consider himself an expert or whatever he calls himself, but um, I'll maybe send you a link to an episode he had with Rob Bell that is yeah, talking about sort of the history of how Celtic Christianity got sort of squashed by Catholic religion and um, cause it was too tied to the elements. It was too tied to like earth and nature. And um, I think Catholic church sort of came along at some point and was like, that's pagan. We don't do that. Right. Um, and sort of robbed the like aliveness, the aliveness of Christianity. Of the... um, and so I think sort of, I've been feeling sort of a call to like return to that. Cause I'm like, the Christianity I was taught doesn't like really work for like, I don't, I don't feel like I can just show up in a normal church and be like, yeah, you guys jive with sort of wherever right. I've come to, you know? So I'm like, I got to find some sort of, gr like you said, grounding spiritual tradition. And that's like, it's not sort of evangelical Christianity, but it feels maybe like a language that is like actually considering where I've come to and also still grounded in an ancient spiritual tradition of some sort. Um, I'll join you in exploring the Celtic Christianity. That's my, that. that's my ancestry. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to, I mean, cause your cat's name, I was like, well, I mean, there's yeah, something McElroy. there for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And McElroy. <laughs> yeah. It's hard I, not to say in an Irish accent, I'm sure. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's something I would be very interested in. Mm. I have like, you know, John O'Donohue and there's some. So funny. That was one of the books things. I was going to open a, the episode with. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's the one on friendship. I don't know. I Anamkara is. Yeah, Anamkara. And then he's got a book of blessings. A lot of beautiful yeah. stuff. I also have been reading like Thomas Merton and Richard Rohr. And, uh, 
Richard Rohr. Yeah, I mean, he's such yeah. a great one for, um, you know, non-toxic Christianity, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you can't but approach the rest, he's pretty If you can't approach the rest, start, you know, start with him. Yeah, the, um, the one I landed on was uh, Women Who Run With the Wolves. Do you know this? Women Who oh, Run With the Wolves? Why did that just... Yes, I don't have it, but that like totally just popped up somewhere for me very recently. Yeah, the the portion I was going to read was um, people do meditation to find psychic enlighten alignment. That's why people do psychotherapy and analysis. That's why people analyze their dreams and make art. That is why some contemplate tarot cards, cast I Ching, dance, drum, make theater, pry out the poem, and fire up their prayers. That's why we do all the things that we do. It is the work of gathering all the bones together. Then we must sit at the fire and think about which song we will use to sing over the bones, which creation hymn, which recreation hymn, and the truths we tell will make the song. These are some good questions to ask till one decides on the song, one's true song. What has happened to my soul voice? What are the buried bones of my life? In what condition is my relationship to the instinctual self? When was the last time I ran free? How do I make life come alive again? Where has La Loba gone to? And later she says, um, like dry bones. And dry bones is actually, it's a, she's speaking about the story of Ezekiel, Ezekiel in the Bible, basically. But she's a, don't think she's a Christian or whatever she is. She's a mystic that straddles all the world. So she's everything all at once, I'm sure. Um, like the dry bones, we so often start out in a desert. We feel disenfranchised, alienated, not connected to even a cactus clump. The ancients called the desert the place of divine revelation. But for women, there is much more to it than that. A desert is a place where life is very condensed. Um, yeah, the desert is not lush like a forest or a jungle. It's very intense and mysterious in its life forms. And I feel like like your sort of choice to go into Alaska felt like a similar, like, it's just a stark environment like where you're like what can survive here it's like very much like the desert right um many of us have lived desert lives very small on the surface and enormous under the ground um blah, blah, blah. a woman's psyche may have found its way to the desert out of resonance or because of past cruelties or because she was not allowed a larger life above ground so often a woman feels that she lives in an empty place where there is maybe just one cactus with one brilliant red flower on it and then in every direction, 500 miles of nothing. But for the woman who will go 501 miles, there is something more. A small, brave house, an old one. She has been waiting for you. Some women don't want to be in the psychic desert. They hate the frailty, the, spar uh, the spareness of it. They keep trying to crank a rusty jalopy and bump their way down the road to a fantasized shining city of, of the psyche. But they are, they are disappointed, for the lush and the wild is not there. It is in the spirit world, the world between worlds, uh, Rio Abaja, Abajo Rio, the river beneath the river. Don't be a fool. Go back and stand under that one red flower and walk straight ahead for that last hard mile. Go up and knock on the old weathered door. Climb up to the cave. It's starting to sound like the end of what I wrote for you. But I didn't read it until after I wrote it. Uh, go up and knock on the old weathered door. Climb up to the cave. Crawl through the window of a dream. Sift the desert and see what you find. It is the only work we have to do. You wish psychoanalytic advice? Go gather bones. <laughs> so. Yeah. I love that. Go gather bones. Well, maybe we need a um, like Celtic slash spirituality book club book or club. some sort of like gathering, I'm in. virtual gathering of some sort. I'm in. Um, Thank you so much, Brandy. Great. All right. Wasn't that pretty incredible? I, I had a feeling that it would be something that would be meaningful to you. I think especially in that part, right, where I'm talking, I, I where we talk through like faith things in particular, if you're someone who has been through um, evangelical Christianity and is, is struggling with how that shows up in your life, even as a person who has tried to incorporate or integrate um, modalities in your world, uh, like faith practices of some kind that don't necessarily embody that, but you still feel like there's like something that you're trying to get at that's not quite there, right? Um, you just can't sort of find a home necessarily. Uh, yeah, I think you'll probably resonate a lot with that. And no, too, I'm serious at the end when Emily and I were talking about a book club about Celtic Christianity and uh, other things that we're considering. 
I am actually serious about possibly starting a, a book club of some kinds that would be around spiritual things or philosophy or in general, this, I think this podcast, even though it's sort of like posed as a, like this plus that can mean a lot of things. And I started it, I've said multiple times, because it was a container where I could combine things that were seemingly dissimilar. And, uh, you know, it comes originally from, I think, a Steve Jobs quote where he says, creativity is just combining the seemingly unconnectable. And yeah, so it's it's about creativity. It's about art. It's about how we practice the art of living, like how we live meaningful lives, all those things, right? But that's also philosophical in nature. I am a deeply spiritual person. I deeply care about complex things. I love talking about nuance and complexity, but like joy and simplicity and ease in your life as well. And if you're just someone who hasn't found a home yet and a place where you feel like there are other people around to talk with you, like I am trying to hopefully create a space where that can happen and you feel more seen than you've ever felt before and able to show up in your nuance and complexity. So continue to stay tuned. Of course, I don't have that quite yet. It hasn't quite yet come together. Um, coalesced, I guess, you know, materialized. I haven't brought it from the ethereal into the material yet, but I am working on it behind the scenes. And yeah, if you are interested in that and you love this podcast, do things like subscribe to the show on YouTube, on, uh, you know, your favorite podcast platform. Sign up for my newsletter. That's where I inevitably announce, uh, other than this podcast, things first and you get behind the scenes content and all those things. So do all of that. Tell your friends about it. I hope continually that you feel, like I said, um, seen in this space. I know that for the first time in my life, in both meeting people who understood just like my personality type and who I was in the world and like the way that my brain functions and my experiences and all those things. It was so profound for me to encounter those things. And I just want to continue to create spaces for you where you feel that as well and that we can all sort of be in this arm in arm together. And like the, I think the podcast trailer says of this show, that, you know, we are in deep need of solutions that can hold complexity and nuance. And I, there's nothing about you that needs to change, even though you've probably spent a lifetime with people telling you that you were too much or too complex, or there was just like so much, you know, like feeling or thinking going on in your brain, and you just didn't really know what to do with that. So I hope this continues to be a space for that. And I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Emily. That's sort of the off mic version of our four hour conversation because four hour conversations are what I love as much as this podcast. I, you know, like lots of people tell me like, it, wow, it's so long. I wish there were like a break in the middle. I gave you a break with Emily, but a break in a four hour conversation is still two, two hour conversations, right? So I, I, I talk a lot. I care about these things. Good, meaningful conversation often doesn't, and connection often doesn't happen until well into you know, meeting someone for the first time or connecting. And I just want to cultivate that space. If you're someone who loves these kinds of conversations and you would sit here forever and listen to it and talk about it and um, chew over these things together, that's that's what I want to create with you. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this sort of behind the scenes content. And yeah, until next time. Oh, just in case, uh, if you want, again, of course, like to go find out more about Emily, go check out the show notes of this episode. Look at the episode description. There are links to her work on there as well. And yeah, just, um, I don't know, maybe Emily and I will host like a book club with you and we talk about some Celtic Christianity or spiritual things and I'll just have a good time together. So yeah, until then and until next time, uh, thank you for being a this plus that person and thank you for listening. And I can't wait until we meet again or we listen again or we hang out sometime in the very near future.